Hi, I'm DJ Ware, and this is the Cyber Gizmo. Today, I'd like to talk about open source. Open source as it was built by us and how it's being taken from us. I want to start with a personal journey and some of my early days experiences with this very thing happening. My journey into what is now called open source didn't begin with GitHub or Linux or any other buzzword. It started with Plato, a computer system so far ahead of its time that it had a real impact on today's world. Chat, multiplayer games, message boards, interactive learning, it all came from Plato. Even, even speech-to-text was an experiment that was done on Plato. In the 1970s, uh, back then, we didn't call it open source. We called it public domain software. And there was a lot of it. It was software that was funded by taxpayer money. And it was usually built inside universities. It was shared freely. Anyone who had access to Plato could study the code, change it, and contribute if they wanted. It was a commons in the truest sense. Now, courseware usually was, usually you had to have permission to gain access to that. But if you asked, you know, generally you could, get, you could get access to it. But just before I graduated, I got a letter from the university and it said very politely that I needed to come uh, to a campus building and uh, sign some paperwork that basically, and according to the document, they had it included there. It basically said, you're going to sign away all of your rights to the software that you wrote. Uh, and, 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 and I was like, for what? <laughs> for what? What's in it for me? And then it, in the letter, it didn't. It didn't threaten directly, but it said failure to sign this may delay your graduation, meaning that they were going to withhold credits and my semester hours <laughs> until I got over there and signed this thing. I wasn't alone. It, it, this happened to all Plato authors. If you want to read more about this time, you can read Brian Deere's uh, book, The Friendly Orange Glow. Yeah. Uh, as a book that chronicles all of this happening. What had taken place was something very similar to what's happening today. Plato was funded in part by ARPA, the National Science Foundation, and the Department of Education, all federal U.S. programs. That money is, of course, taxpayer uh, monies that went into Plato, and so by definition, it was all the software was public domain. And about, I think it was about 77 or so, the funding sources like uh, ARPA had backed out already because they had other projects they wanted to go fund, so they had lost interest in this, and the National Science Foundation felt that they had funded it as far as they needed to. They were growing well past, you know, two and 3,000 users. And so they thought, well, we have, you know, the, the, the cart's been pushed. Now you need to figure out how you're going to fund this going forward. And the Department of Education kind of faded out as well uh, in that they had achieved their goals with the system, and so they moved on. That left the university as the only one that would be funding it, and they did not have those kind of resources to fund a multi-million dollar effort. So uh, in stepped CDC, Control Data Corporation, who agreed to fund it, but there was a catch. They wanted to own the software. Again, it's a corporate investment. I'm investing money in you. I need to show value to my shareholders. And so I, I, we want software we can sell. That's understandable. We get that. Uh, and, and so that quietly rebranded Plato as a private, as private property. And that is pretty common even today as something becomes more valuable, especially in the open source world. So where did the open source world actually come from? I mean, I encountered it years later, uh, I think around 84, 85, maybe, somewhere around in there. And 
Richard Stallman, through the GNU Project and the Free Software Foundation, laid out four essential freedoms. The first one was the freedom to run the program that you had the it was it was free to use. The second was the freedom to study the program, the source code, and modify it. Essential rights if you're going to be able to build on the work of someone else. And then third, the freedom to redistribute it, that you had all the rights to take that code and redistribute it as long as it was free and you didn't demand exorbitant money for the software, but you could charge a fee for support if you wanted. And fourth, the freedom to share your modifications with others. Okay, but the free software wasn't about price. It was about power, transparency, and choice. The word free, though, confused people, especially corporations. They attributed free with low quality, poorly written, something that someone threw together. And so there was an effort underway to rebrand uh, what the uh, FSF had branded as free software into something else. And so by 1998, a group of developers rebranded the movement. They called it open source. And that was led by the open source initiative that was founded by Eric S. Raymond. And I would think uh, Brian Perrins had a lot to do with that as well. I, I just refer, I forget her name. Uh, that was a member of the early open source initiative that actually came up with that during a during a presentation. She actually called it open source. So, but Stallman didn't like that term because he argued that open source stripped away the moral and ethical foundation. That is, he insisted on free being a part of that brand. So he coined the term FOSS, free and open source software. He did the change. Did we change that label to get corporate support? In a word, yeah, yes, absolutely. Uh, and, and here's the question what did we lose in that trade? Because remember, corporations have a, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. That is, every penny spent has to be accountable to something. Uh, that offsets your revenue and creates profit. And so you have, yeah, you have a fiduciary responsibility to those shareholders. And that, that's not evil. That's just the corporations doing their job. That's what they're supposed to do. But as open source grew, the market came calling on us. They, companies saw a free resource and a volunteer army, a pile of reusable code, that they could build an entire business model around. <laughs> kind of, a, yeah, look, we just found a big heap of gold and all we got to do is just scoop in and swoop in and grab it. <laughs> yeah, that's basically what happened. Uh, and so what we're seeing today is the open core model. This is where you'll see corporations take over an open source project They'll, they'll, they'll spin off the, a community version, which is usually some stripped-down version of the original software that they'll push to the community. It might be the last version of it. And then they'll build on top of a forked version that is locked behind a paywall. You have to pay for it. Usually it's a subscription-based service to use that software. So what about the free version of it? Well, there's nothing there that's actually supporting it monetarily. So it sits, it gets outdated eventually. It's missing features and it's barely maintained, uh, you know, because the corporations have a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders. So have it, going over and work on, on that does nothing for their bottom line. That's a cost. So, but if you want to work on it, go right ahead. They'll let you for free. <laughs> free labor to work on the product. And if they find something useful that you did, they'll incorporate it in their paywall version. Uh, but eventually, if, I don't know if you've noticed this, I've seen a few of those community projects just disappear altogether. Uh, yeah, drop deprecated because no one's maintaining it. That's the usual excuse. 
well, this project really isn't being maintained, so we're dropping it. One of the claims that I've heard recently from a very popular developer on YouTube uh, is that open source just copies closed source software. It doesn't innovate anything of itself. Really? Let me just answer that in one word. You don't know what you're talking about. Open source has always led development in innovation. Plato is a good example. It had online collaboration before the internet. Linux reimagined Unix and took it in a brand new direction. Apache, MySQL, Postgres, SQL, Kubernetes, Docker. How do you want to go on? The modern web didn't come from Silicon Valley. It came from all of us. Yeah, the very tools that are being used to lock their cloud are, are open source projects. What about your phone? Well, in many cases, the kernel is Linux. <laughs> Except not the iPhone. That's Unix-based. So, and the tower it connects to? Probably Linux. Uh, what about the services it uses? DNS, SSL, HTML, JavaScript. TCP IP, on and on, all built on open source. Even the web, <laughs> the web browser that is used inside of those machines is open source. We don't just use open source. We live inside an open source bubble. It's all around us, everything we do. Even commercial software has probably a lot of open source libraries in it. Uh, yeah, so... Open source isn't immune uh, to the pressures that captured Plato. Uh, most major open source projects today are underfunded by us. They're, they're not funded well by the community. And so the people that work on it have to eat. They need a place to live. They might need transportation to get them to and from the grocery store or, you know, to their everyday work locations. And so in steps the corporations that will fund projects that they find worthy to, to back. And here we have that lock-in again. Now that particular project needs to show a, a profit. So what happens? Well, there's roadmaps that follow business goals. It's not evil. It's just the way corporations work. Community additions get starved because... Why would I work on this? It doesn't contribute anything to the bottom line. Developers then burn out. They, they get pressure to do more and more features in areas that they don't really want to go. And yet <clears throat> the platform gets monetized and eventually gets locked behind a subscription paywall, and that's the end of it. In the beginning, licenses like the GNU Public License kept the code open. The problem is, is the shift. Uh, that corporations are forcing to more permissive licenses. Examples are, now I'm not, I'm not bad-mouthing these licenses. I'm just telling you like it is. MIT, BSD, Apache, those are permissive licenses uh, that could be used to build commercial software and eventually lock out the source code. Then we're seeing the rise of even the more insidious ones that say they're open source, but they're not. And uh, some examples of that are SSPL, BSL, the Elastic License. Read the license. It, you can't read the code. You can't have access to it. It's not available. So that's not open source. It's open washing. <laughs> or wishing. Yeah, it's a wish list for open source. It's not real. Here's the other thing that kind of bothered me. Uh, it still does, actually. There's something that's hard to ignore that both Richard Stallman and Eric S. Raymond were removed from the organizations that they helped create. Both literally within months of each other. Yes, both of these two figures are very controversial. There's no arguing that. They both had very strong opinions. But removing them allowed others to rewrite the narrative and to redirect the focus of those very organizations. Uh, so if you want to reshape a movement, you start by erasing the memory of how it began. 
And that's why I'm here. I'm here to not let you forget. <laughs> that's my job. That's the only job I have left in life is to help is to help you not forget. So the illusions of community additions, I've seen this happen again and again on many projects. A thriving open source project, it gets underfunded. The business steps in and begins to fund that project to support it. The developers are happy that they're now be able to put food on the table and support their families. So a, sex, a successful business grows around this the corporations are able to gain licensing from support fees that they can charge for it, but that's not enough, right? So the free version gets left behind and a new version gets created. The free version goes into the community edition while the real innovation happens against the paywall version and now the freedom is gone because that, as we said, the community editions aren't going to be up. They're not, there's no reason to update them. They, they, they're just left to die. So, and even the Linux Foundation isn't safe. The Linux Foundation receives millions of dollars from corporations every year. But barely 2% of that ever actually goes back into the kernel. Where does the money go? It goes into funding research projects that have nothing to do with Linux. They go into branding and conferences, executive salaries. And yet, many kernel developers are overworked, they're underpaid, or they're volunteering their time. They eventually burn out. There's nothing in this for them. And so they leave, and that's what's happening. Uh, we're seeing this happening over and over again. There was developers on the Rust project that have left. Developers on the Linux project that have left. Develop two now on on Asai that have left. The founder and one of the one of the major contributors to the graphics uh, support of Asai Linux gone. Both of them gone, and probably more to come. Uh, sadly, so probably more to come. The inherent conflict here is that. Corporations have a legal obligation to prioritize profit. That's not evil. That's just what happens. But it creates an unavoidable conflict with the other side, which is the, the software freedom, the freedom to use it, the freedom to change it, the freedom to redistribute it. And so if we lose that, we lose everything that made it matter. And finally, my, my call to you. Open source was never a development model. It's a promise. Uh, that knowledge should be shared, that we should build things together. Uh, and and if when we find a need for something that's need, needed to be built, right? And that we can ask other people to help us. That freedom matters, even in software, but that promise is fading. If we want it back, we need to learn our history. We need to fund our tools from within our own ranks. We need to challenge corporate capture, and we need to support developers so that they don't get they get to the, the shiny object in their eyes as the corporations dangle money in front of them. We need to be able to defend our values because open source won't survive by accident. It only, freedom only survives if you fight for it. If you lay back and do nothing, you will lose it. And that's true of everything that has to do with it. There's always forces at work that want to remove freedom for whatever reason. Let me ask you a couple of questions in, 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 in closing. What open source projects matter the most to you? What do you see that's changing? Do you, is this better or is it for the worse? Drop your drop your comments below. I'd love to I'd love to start this conversation with you, and uh, I hopefully and continue it on.